You're watching the New Stack Makers, a podcast for people who develop, deploy, and manage at scale software. For more information and articles about at scale technologies, please visit thenewstack.io. Now enjoy the show. The Cloud Native Computing Foundation, or CNCF, hosts critical components of the global technology infrastructure. CNCF brings together the world's top developers, end users, and vendors, and runs the largest open source developer conferences. All right, now here we go. I was saying to Damani, Damani Corbin here, who I'm with, who is Global Software Strategy Open Source Program Office at Boeing. And I said, you know what? I want to talk about complexity. And Damani said, yes. Because <laughs> I'm thinking, like, when I got here, I started talking to people about complexity, and it just seemed that it's the theme here I'm hearing all week long. It's like complexity is overwhelming now. You know, it's so overwhelming. And I like what Tim Hawkins said today. He said in his keynote, which he talks a lot about complexity, and he mm -hmm. said, the re result is increased operational and conceptual complexity. And then there's this idea of, of a complexity budget, right? How much are you really going to allow in your budget for complexity? There's just a finite amount of complexity that we can absorb over a certain amount of time, and I have to think you can relate to that at Boeing. Indeed, indeed. Um, I, one thing that you just mentioned came to mind was the color of money, um, but we won't go there just yet. Uh, when I entered Boeing, I underestimated the complex nature of the business. Inside of a Fortune 100 company, uh, let's use these numbers. I'm not sure if these is exact, but rough, yeah, right? right? So let's say 6,000 engineers. Let's say 60,000 aerospace engineers. Oh, wow. And then 160,000 employees. Wow. So the dynamic nature of what I'm trying to accomplish inside of the organization, uh, many vendors don't understand it. Yeah. And many other end users don't have the same type of complexities within inside of their organizations. Even if they're regulated, the type of regulation in the different regulator bodies that we have to uh, abide by are completely different. Oh man, there's so much there, like 6,000 developers. And how, how deep is the complexity and what does the open source office do to help in the management of that? Yeah, so one thing that our VP of Software Engineering, um, Jenna Hussein, when he joined the organization about three years ago, what he wanted to do was have visibility across what's happening from a software engineering perspective. And one of the ways he was able to measure that was trying to reorg and shift all engineers, software engineers, underneath his purview. So that's where that 6,000 number comes up, right? However, that 6,000 software engineering number doesn't indicate everyone who is still writing software. So from an open source perspective, I'm looking at the number of people who are downloading open source software <laughs> and I have a lot more than 6,000. So there's still pockets uh, of individuals yeah. that are writing code that are would-be software engineers in another type of a company that we don't typically refer to as software engineers. So that's one complexity to begin with. That speaks to personas. That's correct. And so there's multiple personas inside an organization. I, I, uh, I really got a sense of this in talking to IKEA. Mm -hmm. And they have multiple data science personas, for example. So you're saying that this persona issue is, a, is complex at a different kind of a scale than, than most organizations know. So how does open source help with that? How do you? Yeah, so, so from an open source perspective, I go around the organization having conversations and ensuring that we just talk to each other internally. And, and, and that's a job, just yeah. making sure that one group knows what the other group is doing. And I say we're doing three things. Number one, how do we make it easier for our developers to consume open source software? Okay. That's one. Number two, how do I make it easier for my developers to contribute back to open source projects and participate in the open source communities like the Cloud Native Computing Foundation, the Linux Foundation? 
And then number three is how do I identify opportunities for inner sourcing such that we can share some of the best things that are happening internally with different groups? So can I break down some of those silos so we can hit a critical mass in some of the great software that's already being built with inside the company? So inner sourcing, let's talk about that because mm -hmm. it's not a topic we talk a lot about. What is inner sourcing? What does it mean to you? Yeah, so, so I, I'm, I mean, from an easy standpoint, I would say it is open sourcing, but just inside of your company firewalls. Right. So it's the same framework, um, but we're trying to be uh, reused as much as possible. So we're trying mm -hmm. to abstract away the different uh, data that is uh, restricted or have different requirements and come to what is the, the least common denominator that can be reused across the organization. The least common and if we, if we start with that goal in mind from the beginning, the way that we build will be different. So we have to have a, a culture shift of this is not just going to be used for me and my program. This piece of it, I can build it such that someone else within inside of the company may also be able to benefit from it. And so do you take open source projects and bring them internally and like fork them and then bring them internally? Is that kind well, of? Well, we're, we're getting away from that. We're getting away from that and what we're doing is trying to better participate. So the nature of our business is that we would bring things in and they would fork them, that's the nature. But what we would do now is like, hey, how can we cut down those barriers in that we separate the pieces that are business critical and we separate the pieces that we can now contribute back because security is important to the entire community. We have a higher sensitivity to security, but we don't need to just marry that for our products. The security that we're building into open source, we're trying to share that more with the community. So, I was going to ask the why question. It seems like why are you cutting back on internalizing open source projects? And what I'm hearing is, it's a security matter. Is it just more than that? Is it the part of that? Is it security in some sense, but not in others? What is it? So I would say, um, historically, the culture around open source is not what it is today. Open source is not new within inside of the Boeing company. It's been going on for a long time, but there hasn't been a central source of control in terms of how is this going to impact the wider organization. So what we were able to do with inside of the open source program office is to work very closely with legal, to work very closely with intellectual property, to work very closely with information security. So all of these different people who are working some part of open source at the side of their desk, we're pulling it all together and making sure that we have an enterprise strategy that's beneficial for the masses. So what is that doing for you? Like, tell me like, you know, so you have this centralized office, you work with legal. I mean, we've talked a lot about open source program offices at the new stack over the years, and that seems very like, very, you know, solid kind of approach. Mm -hmm. But what, what, can you, what can you point to internally and the difference that it makes? So many people approach I suppose in many different ways. Some approach it from a legal and a compliance standpoint. What we've decided to do at Boeing is to lean into the community aspect. So we led with our commitment to the, the Cloud Native Computing Foundation, to the Linux Foundation, such that we're providing opportunities for, for collaboration with our software engineers. And we're not coming in trying to slap their hands and say, why are you downloading this or why are you downloading yeah, that? Yeah. We're saying, here are the things and here are the communities that we are comfortable with and we want to encourage you to participate in these strategic communities because we like the governance structure, we want to dive further into that channel. And then we further show you the paths that you can further work on your personal development. So engineers want to co co collaborate on cool projects. So how do we help them work on cool projects that's for their personal development? and then we draw the line between what's a business requirement and what's a, what's a, a, a resume-driven development type of project, if you will. So, can you provide any examples of those projects? Yeah, so, I mean, let, let's, let's go to Git, right. right? 
we've leaned in to GitOps. We're making it very easy for teams to adopt, get, to adopt GitLab. Okay. To migrate into a Git infrastructure. Okay. We have, so, so that's one example. So you're using GitLab, which is recently adopted, as I understand, Flux. And so are you using Flux then? Too? Yeah, but, I mean, we have teams utilizing Flux. We have teams utilizing Argo CD. Okay. Love the approach. Huge fans of GitOps, but teams are utilizing both. So really, GitOps is one of those examples. That seems like a really strong, fundamental aspect of software development. And how long have you been adopting GitOps? So there's, there's teams that have adopting it for a long time, for, for at least three years now. Okay. We've been on a path of educating and showing the benefit to software engineering teams. Certain teams have different business requirements that may change the level of adoption. However, my goal is to lower the barrier to entry such that it's a no-brainer for you to walk into this new place because it's easy, it's comfortable, and we're providing it for you. So you, uh, so you contribute, do, do the members then contribute back to those projects such as Argo and Flux and, and, uh, and participate in GitLab too? Yeah, so we are participating in those communities. I'm trying more so to create the culture of you know, getting involved into the tags getting involved into the into the groups because that wasn't the culture. Ah. So showing up at the meetings is the first part. Yeah. Trying to understand what are the issues, trying yeah. to understand just how the community operates is a shift. Now, is this something that you can find something to get into? Like for example, open telemetry. We have teams that are adopting that by the droves. Now they're trying to understand how can you contribute? Are there bug fixes that you find that you don't just fix, but that you can contribute back? So it's, it's a staggered approach of trying to make it friendly to contribute back to these communities. So I get the sense what you're trying to do in essence is find the projects that are like on the, on the pulse of the community. That's correct. And, and, and please remember that this also extends beyond just the CNCF and the Linux Foundation, right? Right. So I would like to utilize the CNCF graduating, incubating projects as a use case. However, there may be other communities or other projects that are of importance for my, my software engineers. And I'm saying, well, go ahead and lean into that. Is there a deficit there? Is there a way that you can add value? And we're just utilizing this as an opportunity to show them how they can participate. Why is this so important to Boeing? This is important to all large organizations because we consume so much value from these open source software and there's single contributors who are not getting paid. Large organizations need to do a better job of giving back to these communities. And we don't want to give it lip service, we're trying to double down to make sure that our business leaders understand the importance of what's being done by the community. So we have a bunch of uh, community folks who are now evangelizing and making it normalizing us contributing back. We want to get to a stage where we can be able to pay software engineers to work on open source projects. We're not there today. We're not uh, a, a, an open source company where people are coming from that, but we would like to move in that direction. And that's what we're pushing for internally. So how are you pushing for it internally? Well, education. So a business leader may not understand the intricacies of why. Why, what's the benefit of allowing my software engineer or one FTE to work on that project. Well, what does the impact to the business if there's a critical CVE that comes out and you can't get in touch with that maintainer? What, what would the benefit be if you had the subject matter ac expert sitting across from you? So we need to build that expertise internally so that we can work more closely with the community. And that's what we're trying to educate our executives across the board to make sure that everyone understands the value and the impact. Do you have, do you have senior level support? We do, we do, we do. But again, we're a large organization that's complex. <laughs> so there's different change of commands, there's different engineering leaders, there's different departments that all have perceptions. So the education needs to be ongoing. It definitely needs to be ongoing. 
I think just in conclusion, I'd like to circle it back mm -hmm. to this question about complexity. How does it surface internally at your developer teams? Because like, you know, we heard Tim Hawken talk about complexity today. We heard of it be discussed as like a never ending project. Open telemetry is a never ending project. All these projects are never ending. How are you, how does, what is that intersection of managing complexity and open source intersect for you? And how does that play into your job at Boeing? So I think we need to break it out into bite-sized chunks. Okay. Um, I have about 15 software engineers that I was able to bring with me to, to uh, KubeCon. Okay. Um, but they're in different sides of the business. Okay. One group is building a software factory that they're going to be serving multiple different constituents. One group is building an application. Uh, however, they've already servicing a program that's already on their path of utilizing Kubernetes. Another group is in a closed area. They will never be connected to the internet. There's no internet connection. I need... Stop, my, secret, stop. <laughs> I need my teams to communicate with not specifically what you're working on, but what problems are you solving? The communication. Now, as we come here, we can aggregate the problems that we're solving. We need to share that with our vendors so our vendors can better help us solve those problems. And then we can better be able to solution when we understand the complexities of our business and there's not a one size shoe fit all. What fun it sounds like you're having at Boeing. <laughs> Listen, every day uh, I meet a new team and I'm learning something new. Uh, we're essentially running a startup in a 100-year-old company. Uh, we have teams that are working on submarines. We have teams that are working on jets. We have teams that are working on airplanes. We have teams that are working on things at the far edge. And Kubernetes and cloud native is everywhere. So it's of high importance to us to lean into this community and make sure that there's certain application teams that has not even experienced it yet, but it's coming. So we need to prepare for what's coming. I just have then a last question. Because I know how hard it can be. Everyone has challenges in their job. And often, like in my job, I have a really good idea what a sponsor should be doing, right? Like when they're writing posts, I'm like, I think I have a good idea how you should be doing that, right? But a lot of the challenge we face is like, even just getting people to write posts, right? I'm wondering what it is like that challenge that you face internally in talking to people when you know it's the right way to go, but you have people who don't necessarily understand what you're talking about or oh. don't want to listen to what you're talking about. Do you have children? 28 and 30. So I have a three-year-old, a five-year-old, and a seven-year-old. Nice. When you slap your child on the hands every time and tell them, don't do this, don't do that, don't do that, you limit the creativity of the children. Yeah. What you want to do is start to unlock and allow the creativity, but with guardrails. Yeah. What we're trying to do is establish guardrails such that the software engineers aren't feeling stifled. They still feel that they can be creative in their roles, but there are sufficient guardrails that the business is happy with. And what we're trying to do is work with a number of different uh, stakeholders with inside of the company to understand the needs of the software engineers to ensure that the restrictions that were there in the past uh, do not stifle creativity. Thank you so much uh, for joining us, Damani. I really appreciate your time. Sounds like you're having a good time at, uh, at Boeing. So. I am, thank you so much for having me. This was a great opportunity. Appreciate it. If you like this video, please give us a thumbs up and if you'd like to see more videos like this, you can always subscribe to our YouTube channel. We're on all the major social media platforms. You can always find us at thenewstack.io. We hope to see you soon.